I'm there. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we're talking now about Jesus teaching on faith. What did Jesus teach us concerning faith? Um, the second statement that we will make concerning Jesus teaching on faith is this, that Jesus taught very clearly that we will receive according to our faith. Now I'll, I will come to the questions that have been put in the chat. Um, you know, we will keep some time to do, to that. So we will take questions and respond to them. Um, let's just go forward a little bit. So Jesus taught us that we will receive according to our faith. So we could call this the law of faith. So Matthew, for example, Matthew 8 and verse 13, the centurion who came to Jesus on behalf of his servant, Jesus said, as told him, as you have believed, let it be done for you. As you have believed, let it be done for you. That means you've believed it, you believed in your heart. You believe something in your heart. In accordance to your believing, may you receive. Or your receiving is in accordance to your believing. Or in Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, Two blind men came to him. He said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, yes. It says he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith, let it be to you. Now, this is so positive. Why? Because no one and nothing can keep you from receiving from God. The law of faith is, according to your faith, it will be done to you. According to your believing will be your receiving. That's the law of faith. So there's no force of man, no force of the devil that can stop you from receiving. According to your faith, it will be done for you. So this is very strong, it's very positive. So it should encourage us. Jesus told me, according to my faith, it will be done for me. And so I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith. And it will be to me according to my faith. No man can stop it. No devil can stop it. This is the law of faith. It's very positive. Thirdly, we see that our will and desire is involved in the exercise of faith. So I want to emphasize this because uh, traditionally or conventionally, people think faith means I just take a passive posture and say, God, let it be to me as you will. But that really is not faith. Faith engages your will. Faith doesn't disengage your will or disengage your desire. Faith engages your will. Faith pulls or your desire. Or faith is based on that. That our will and our desire is involved in the exercise of faith. So look at some examples and how Jesus spoke to people. You know, when, when this woman, uh, she was a Canaanite woman, she was not a Jewish woman. She came to Jesus because her daughter was uh, troubled by demons. Now, we don't know her exact condition, but she just said, my daughter is troubled by demons. So when she came and, and, and she made her way to Jesus, and uh, eventually, you know, Jesus turns around to her and says, woman, 
great is your faith. So, woman, your faith is great. So Jesus is really impressed uh, by this woman's faith. And he tells her, let it be to you as you desire. So you see, faith and desire. Faith and desire. They are coupled together. Traditionally, people disengage desire from faith. They say, oh God, whatever you desire, God, you give to me. But God is saying, what is it that you desire? So this woman desired, or sometimes the word desire, it may be a very uh, a light, you know, she, for her, it was like, I must have this. She was determined, she had a determined desire. You know, it was, it was strong determination. She was determined to have it. And that undergirded her faith. And Jesus called it great faith. You know, that's why in the definition of faith, in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you have a hope, you have a desire. That's something you're going after. And faith gives substance to it. Or faith is the substance of those things. So, for us to have great faith, we must have determined desire, like this woman. You also see it, you know, in some other instances, um, in, in Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 51 to 52. Can somebody read these verses for us, please? Mark 10, 51 to 52. Mark 10, 51 to 52. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Amen. Amen. Now, in Mark 10, we have a blind man who was crying out to Jesus. And Jesus asking him a question, which is, you know, it's like, why are you asking him this question? But Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? It might seem very obvious Hey, here's a blind man is crying out to Jesus. Uh, it's highly likely he's crying out so that Jesus could heal him. But yet Jesus is, uh, he doesn't presume that. He asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And the man says, I, Lord, Master, I want to receive my sight. I want my sight. And then Jesus says, your faith, your faith has made you well. What I want to emphasize is Jesus is asking him to state very clearly, what do you want me to do for you? Now imagine if this blind man's response was, Lord, give me anything you want. Now that's how many, many people pray. Now this man didn't say that. He said, I want my sight. Very clear. I want to receive my sight. Now, if we pray like that today, some people think we are being, you know, proud, you're being arrogant, or, you know, hey, how can you do that? Well, Jesus expected us to do that. He wants us. He wants our will, our desire to be involved in this process of exercising faith in God. So, Keep that in mind, that when we are going to exercise, believe God for something, we must be determined to get it. We must have a desire for it. It must be something that we really want.
to have something. Like, God, I really want this in my life. You know, whether it's a healing, whether it's a provision, whether it's, a, you know, maybe you believe in God for a job or believing God for an open door in your life or believing God to change a situation. You've got to be saying, God, I must have this. Not, our posture should not be God. If it happens, it's okay. If it doesn't happen, don't worry. I'll take care of myself. That's not our approach to faith. Our approach to faith is, God, I have to see this happen. It must happen. I'm determined to see this happen. That's how these people came. The blind man didn't come to Jesus and say, Lord, you know, whatever you want. If you think I need, you know, uh, some money, you give me some money. If you think I need some clothes, give me some clothes. If you think I need some food, give me some food. Or if you think I need to be healed, you can heal me. Whatever you want, Lord. He didn't say that. He said, God, or he said, Master, I want my sight. In Mark 11, 24, when Jesus teaches about faith, uh, in that passage that I've just mentioned was one verse here, um, he teaches us, you know, how do we use faith when we pray? He says, uh, oh yeah, could somebody read for us Mark 11, 24 and also John 15, 7. We'll read both these verses, please. Somebody could read it. Therefore, uh, Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. John fifteen seven. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Thank you. Notice here in Mark eleven twenty four. Whatever things you ask whatever things you ask so we are doing it right or the king james the old the old the older version says whatever you desire in john 15 7 he says you will ask what you desire see even when it comes to praying, he's saying, you ask, you desire. So I can't, you know, um, uh, 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 what to say, uh, uh, I, I can't leave that part to God. No, God is saying, you make up your mind. What you ask, what you desire. Right? So, our will is involved in the exercise of faith. So we have to decide. God, I, I want to see this happen in my life. You decide, and then you ask, or you desire for it. I want to see this happen. Okay, I'm emphasizing this because this is one place many of us miss it. We come thinking that if God gives it, it's okay. Uh, if I don't get it, it's okay. So, you know, we're not, we don't have a determined desire. We're not like set on it. And many times our, our prayers go unanswered and our faith is not effective simply because of this problem that we actually don't really desire it. Uh, we're just, it's kind of, you know, what we say as, we, only, we are only wishing for it. If we, It's a wish. If I get it, it's good. If I don't get it, it's okay. But that's not the way these people came to Jesus. They came very clear about what they wanted. So whatever you ask when you pray, whatever you desire, you ask. Right? And that's how faith uh, is uh, exercised. Now, uh, some people will say, well, you know, and I, I'm taking a little side excursion here, just bear with me, because, you know, some sometimes people will say, well, Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, he taught us to pray like that. True. But, in praying, your will be done on earth. 
we are not saying I don't have a will or we are not saying Lord whatever you want what the implication is we must know his will and we are praying what he wants down here on earth so our prayer is an engagement with God to make sure what he wants done is enforced here on earth. We are joining with our will, joining our will with his will to see it done. So it's an active thing. It's not a passive thing. It's not like, oh God, I'm sitting back and I'll go to sleep and your will be done while I'm asleep. No. It's I'm engaging with God. I know what's his will. I want to see it done. And what is his will? His word reveals to us his will. His word reveals very clearly that God desires to heal. God desires to provide. Uh, God desires to deliver. God desires to bless. God desires to prosper. Uh, God desires, you know, the good things. He, he desires blessing his people. That's his will. And so we actively engage with his will. We don't just passively, uh, you know, uh, remain inactive and expect his will to be done. So I just kind of summarize that here. Another uh, thing that people may say as well, you know, Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, it's not as I will, but as you will. They will mention this but keep in mind that Jesus prayed like this only once I mean recorded for us and it is only in one particular context but he prayed not as I will but as you will he never prayed like this when he was ministering to the sick. He never prayed like this when he was working miracles. He never prayed like this when he was casting out demons. He prayed like this only one in one context. That is, when he had to go to the cross. When he had to surrender everything to take on the sins of the whole world, that's the only time he prayed like this. Not as I will, but as you will. Why? Because it was such a painful thing. That's why he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if I have to do it, I'll do it. So you can imagine this was the perfect, sinless Son of God. And on the cross, the sins of the world were going to be put on him. So obviously, that was a very, very difficult thing. So in that context, he prayed, not as I will but as you will. He never prayed like this when he was working miracles. He never prayed like this when he was calming storms and rebuking the wind. He never prayed like this in any other context. So we shouldn't pray like this in any other context. We pray like this only when we are surrendering to the plan and the purpose of God of, to his assignment for our lives. Meaning, maybe God is calling you to step into a certain assignment. Uh, you know, sometimes it's something you're all excited about, and then this is not an issue. You just jump in and go and do it. Sometimes He calls us uh, to take up an assignment that may be quite challenging. It may be very demanding. It may be something we are not naturally excited to do. But that's when we surrender and say, Lord, I know you want me to take up that assignment. You want me to do that work, but uh, I know it's hard for me, but I will do it. Not as I will, but as you will. That's the context. But you don't pray like this when you're believing God for miracles or when you're believing God for healing or deliverance or provision. No. In all of those cases, all the other situations of life, you're praying very clear. God, I want to see your promise fulfilled. So I just addressed these two because um, these are common things that people bring up when we say, you know, your will is involved. And then they say, but Jesus said these things. Yeah, but there's a context to it. And we must understand that in all the exercise of faith, there is, our will must be involved, right? 
There is one case when uh, a leper came to Jesus. And the leper prayed like this. You know, the leper said these words. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus' immediate response was, I am willing, be cleansed. This is in Matthew chapter 8. In other words, when it came to healing, there was no question about his will. The leper came. He was wondering, Lord, if you're willing. Jesus' immediate response is, hey, relax. Don't even question my will. My will is for you to be well. I am willing. Be cleansed. He didn't say, if it be God's will, be cleansed. No, I am willing. Be cleansed. So, how do we know God's will? Well, God's will is always consistent with, the, with God's nature. It is expressed in God's word. It's revealed in God's promises. Right? Um, let me see. Is there a question on the chat? I heard something. Um, let me look. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I will take up this question, but a quick answer to John Paul, yes, yeah, that's fine. That's uh, when, when it's, uh, when it has to do with, you know, God's assignment for our lives, uh, we, we pray if it be that way. But I'll come back and address that uh, in a little bit more detail, okay. All right, so how do we know God's will? Well, God's will is always consistent with God's nature. That means who God is. Now, how do we know who God is? One, we know who God is as we see him in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God revealed to us. Did Jesus heal the sick? Yes. Did he work miracles? Yes. Did he turn anyone away? No. That's God. That's who God is. God's nature is expressed to us through the names of God. So when God said, I am Jehovah Rapha, he's saying, I am the Lord Jehila. That's God's nature. When God said, I am Jehovah Jireh, he's saying, I'm the Lord your provider. That's God's nature. He's the God who provides. When he said, I am Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who gives you victory. That's God's nature. He's the God who causes his people to come out victorious, and so on. In all the names of God, God's nature is revealed to us, who God is. And that is always constant. It doesn't change. You know, God doesn't wake up one day and say, sorry, today I've changed my name. I'm no longer Jehovah Rapha. No, it, he's always constant. He doesn't change. So the will of God is always consistent with the nature of God. So the first way to determine the will of God is, who is my God? What did he say about himself? And that's how he is always. He doesn't change. He will never say or do anything that is contrary to his own nature. Secondly, God's will is always expressed in his word. What does his word say? What did he show us in his word? So you go to the Bible. You know, Don't look at another person to deter, decide God's will. Oh, this happened in that person's life. Well, that's somebody's experience, but somebody's experience is, doesn't necessarily reveal God's will. You go to the word of God. Thirdly, God's promises. God's promises are an expression of God's will because the fact that he promised indicates he wants us to have it. Otherwise, he would never have promised it in the first place. So when he says, when his word says, he forgives all our sins. He heals all our diseases. The reason he said it is because he wants us to have it. He wants us to experience healing from all our diseases. He satisfies our mouth with good things. He renews our youth like the eagles. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. All this, it's in, in the word of God. It's part of his promises. And so it's an expression of what God wants us to have. It is his will for us to have it. So remember these three simple things. God's will is 
consistent with his nature, with his word, and with his promise. So always, you know, uh, when it's a matter of God's will, you connect your desire to it and say, God, I want to have it. And don't be light about it. There's no need to pray if it be thy will, when his will has already been expressed. You know, so imagine a father and a child, or a parent and a child. And if the parent said, you know, to the child, hey, I'm going to get you ice cream today. The child is not going to come and say, you know, mom, dad, you said, if, you know, mom and dad, you know, if you really want to give me, you know, if you'd really like to get me ice cream. No, the parent said, I will get you ice cream. The child is going to be expecting the ice cream, you know because the parent has already expressed it's going to come, right? So keep that in mind, so that uh, faith involves, I'm just going back to that statement, our, desire and, our will and desire is involved in the exercise of faith. Let me just move on to maybe a couple of more and then we will pause and take questions. Number four, faith is key to seeing God's glory manifested. Could somebody read John 11 and verse 40 for us, please? John 11 and verse 40. John 11 verses 40. Jesus said to her, Didn't not I say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Okay, thank you. So, the situation is, when Jesus is standing here before the tomb of Lazarus, along with Mary and Martha, Lazarus has been dead four days. And uh, of course, Mary and Martha are very troubled, or, you know, Jesus wept when he saw what was happening. And, uh, but he knew what God wanted to do in that situation that the father wanted is going to bring, you know, wanted Lazarus back. And so he tells him, you know, move the stone. And, you know, the sisters object, say, you know, he's been dead four days. It's a, 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 there's going to be a smell coming, a stench. And then he responds to uh, the Mary or Martha. He says, did I not tell you? So that means he had already had a conversation with them. Now that conversation is not recorded for us. So he must have, and I'm just imagining based on this statement here, he must have gone and had a private conversation with Mary and Martha and said, look, Mary and Martha, I know that Lazarus has been dead four days, but you know, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So try to imagine in your mind, Jesus having a private conversation with Mary and Martha there's the tomb of Lazarus. There are all these, you know, family and friends and people who are around the tomb. They are weeping. And uh, Jesus takes Mary and Martha aside and he tells them. And I'm just, you know, we don't have this recorded, but I'm, I'm, I'm just imagining this based on this statement that Jesus made. I'm imagining Jesus would have told them and said, you know, uh, Mary and Martha, I know. Uh, you sent mess you sent me a message the moment Lazarus fell ill, uh, and I didn't come right away. Uh, uh, maybe he gave him the reason why he didn't come right away. Uh, but I'm here right now, and I know it's already four days. But I want to tell you, Mary and Martha, that even at this moment, uh, if we believe, we will see God do a mighty miracle. Lazarus will come back. So you must have had this private conversation with them. And then he goes up to the tomb and he announces, he says, hey, could somebody move the stone away? Open up the tomb. And then, you know, uh, Mary and Martha, one of them come and, uh, you know, object and they say, um, yeah, uh, Martha, Martha says, you know, uh, Lord, I mean, don't do that. You know, uh, he, he's dead four days. So he's reaffirming to Martha what he had just told them privately. So he says, Martha, did I not just tell you? Did I not say to you? So what was the conversation he had with them? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. 
If you believe, you will see the glory of God. That's the same thing Jesus will teach you and me today. If he had to sit down with you and me, he'd say, I want you to know something. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. He will say the same thing to you and me. He hasn't changed. His truth has not changed. It's 2,000 years, but his truth has not changed. That means in any given situation, for Mary and Martha, this was their situation. Their brother had died. It's, it's been four days. You and I will face different kinds of situations in life. Jesus will sit down with you and me, and he'll tell us the same thing. I want you to know, in this situation, if you believe God, you will see the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It is an expression, it is a demonstration of who God is and what he does, of the nature and the power of God. That means he says, you will see God move in on your situation and he's going to do a work that only he can do. So once again, we are saying, our believing becomes God's opportunity to work through us and release his glory. So we must believe. Faith is key to seeing God's glory. And connected to this is the fifth statement that we're making based on the teachings of Jesus, that when things go from bad to worse, Jesus will tell us only believe. And we have already seen this before, you know, in the case of Jairus, and uh, Jairus, is, Jairus comes to Jesus and says, Lord, you know, my daughter is very sick, please come home. So Jesus, uh, you know, accommodates that request. He's, uh, he is uh, on his way with Jairus, but along the way, they get news saying, hey, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the master. Don't trouble him anymore. But in that situation, when Jesus heard the word that was spoken, that means he heard the bad news. He said to Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. What would Jesus tell us today when there is bad news? we can be absolutely certain he'll tell us the same thing. Do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. That's the same thing he'll tell us. Don't let fear come in, just believe. So, we also need to align our mind and our thinking to the teaching of Jesus. When things go from bad to worse, do not be afraid, only believe. When there is bad news, do not be afraid, only believe. Because that's the same thing Jesus will tell you. So you can just imagine Jesus standing next to you. If any news comes that's troubling or disturbing, Jesus is going to tell you and tell me immediately, don't be afraid, believe, just believe. All right. Okay, maybe I will pause here and we will pick this up next week. I'm just going to go into looking at the chat to answer questions. So that we could, uh, so questions um, on what we have discussed so far, right? Let's, uh, let's please feel free to ask. I'm going to look at uh, Rebecca's question. Um, sometimes faith is working and uh, sometimes it's not. It's been a situation lack of faith. Okay. All right. So, there is uh, a question here. Uh, when we don't find our faith producing, you know, we're not seeing the outcome, we're not seeing the result of 
what we have been believing God for, uh, why does that happen? Is it because of the situation? Is it because of the lack of faith? So, um, uh, Rabbi Khan, you know, there is no one set answer, right? Because there are different factors that uh, influence what is happening. So one could be, um, you know, my faith hasn't come to the place where it is ready to produce, right? And we're going to learn about this, that faith needs to be brought to that place where it is able to produce, cause and change, cause uh, something to happen, right? So we saw, for instance, in James 2, verse 22, it says uh, about Abraham, that by works, his faith was made perfect. That means his faith came, the word perfect simply means mature. Uh, his, his faith was brought to a place where it could produce. Right? So that's one facet, one aspect to it, right? That uh, uh, it takes time, some, you know, for the faith, for faith to come to that place where it produces. And very often, we tend to give up. And I think in James chapter one, it says, you know, that when you're going to, uh, this is, I think it's verse three, when you're going through difficulties, it says, let um, James one, verse three, uh, verse three and four, it says, the testing of your faith produces patience. And, um, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. So he's saying, look, when your faith is being tested, don't quit, have endurance mm -hmm. so that you can be made perfect. That means you can be made mature. You come to that place where you can produce. So the second thing is, Many times we give up during the testing process. So we start off in faith and the faith is being tested. You know, something, it's not work. It doesn't seem like it's working. It's not like faith is not working, but it's, we are in that testing phase and we quit. We give up. We say, okay, maybe it's not for me. Uh, maybe God doesn't want me to have it. You know, we give up. But James 1, 3 and 4 is saying, the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its run its full course. That means keep running, you know, keep enduring, don't quit so that you may be perfect. That means through that process of faith and endurance, we are being brought to the place where we are ready to see the outcome. But many of us, we give up in during that testing phase. And so we don't see the result of faith. Right, uh, so uh, we will, um, you know, we will talk more about this uh, as uh, as you learn about how to exercise faith. Right, we will outline how to exercise faith. Okay, but I'm just give us giving us a little preview. Uh, I think the next question is from John Paul. Yeah, uh, is it okay to pray if it's God's, if it's if it is God's will? Lead me, especially when it comes to life, marriage, job offers. Uh, and so on. Yeah. So, you know, uh, there are, so concerning those matters, right? So these are things that having to do with your, the life decision, the future God wants us, us to step into. There are times when God reveals his will to us and we know it very clearly. And then we pursue with determined faith. You know, I, uh, just as an example, I remember uh, when I had to get married, uh, I was, I was at that time, I was, uh, you know, this was many years ago. <laughs> uh, I was actually in New Jersey. I was living in New Jersey that time. My wife was in Malaysia and, uh, you know, we had, you know, fixed the date, everything. And, and I had to get a visa to go, uh, go to go to Malaysia and the wedding was going to be happening in Malaysia. And, uh, you know, so I went to the Malaysian consulate in New York to apply for a visa. And for whatever reason, there were some problems. I, I, I forget what was 
you know, what caused the delay and all of that. But it came down to the final, final thing was, it came down to I had Friday was the only work, last working day and I was fly, flying out on Monday morning. My ticket was booked, already booked and I don't know what the delays was and what caused all the delays, but it came down to that. And, uh, you know, and uh, I, and I forget all the details, the interactions, but I remember what I do remember, and I know what I did was, you know, Friday morning, uh, they had said, look, we can't get your passport back with the visa stamped, uh, whatever the difficulty was, I don't know. And Monday morning, I'm flying. Five o'clock Friday, the office closes, the consular office closes. So if I don't get my passport back and my with the visa, I cannot fly. Uh, but what did I do in that situation? I knew the will of God. So I said, I will not take no, I mean, I didn't tell the consulate. This was in my personal prayer. I went back to my room where I was staying. I said, I will not take no for an answer. I take authority over the situation. I command, I decree that my visa and my passport will come through before five o'clock today. And I will take the flight Monday morning. Right? So in this situation, because I know the will of God, I'm going to dominate it with faith. Right? And this is concerning first marriage. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I got my passport with the visa stamp. They were surprised that it actually came through and I got it and I flew out, right? So just one example where, you know, you have to dominate when you know the will of God. Now, when you don't know the will of God concerning, you're not very clear about a situation, then that's when you say, Father, I, you know, I, I, I have these options in front of me. I'm not very sure uh, what to do. So, Lord, um, please guide me. Give me your wisdom or give me your guidance. That's when you're praying. You're, 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 you know, you're in that open position where you're saying, God, you know, lead me, guide me. Or God, just order my steps and direct me to, you know, the best opportunity, the, the opportunity that would be best for me. Uh, you know, so if you have three options in front of you, as far as a job is concerned, and you're not very sure which one to pick, that's when we pray and say, God, just lead my steps. You trust, you're still having faith, that God will direct your steps to the right one, right? So like that, you know, we can share many examples where we have to pursue things with faith in our hearts to see the result. In things where we are not very clear, or we're not sure, uh, you know, for about what needs to be done, that's when we say, Lord, please guide my steps. I'm not very clear, and I'm fine with anything, you know, those kind of things you pray, Lord. You, you're surrendering to whatever God guides you. I hope I answered that question, John. Uh, next one is from Sid Canoe Robert. Number five. When things go from bad to worse, only believe. But as humans, sometimes we are not able to believe and Satan also puts suffering on us. It's like a chaos. So what to do in these kind of situations? Yeah. Yeah, true, Sid Canoe. That, uh, you know, going through those situations... Uh, it is very difficult, but, uh, you know, we have to believe God. We, you know, you put yourself in a place where you say, God, I have no option, but I'm going to believe you for this. And you spend time in the word, feed your faith with the word of God and uh, believe God. Now, um, I'll just share one more example. Um, you know, um, when I was a graduate student in graduate school, uh, now I went to the, uh, I did my bachelor's degree here in India. Then I went to, the, to, to America to do my graduate studies. And um, I remember, you know, my, my, my parents paid for my ticket and for my first semester. And I promised them, I said, I will take care of my fees. So you don't have to worry. After this, I will take care of it because I was putting my faith in God. I said, God, you will take me through. And I remember when I was in New Jersey and I, I transferred college, I moved to Rutgers University there in New Jersey. Um, I was doing research uh, and uh, I had to get back to you know my, my studies. 
I took a year's break when I was doing just research and then I had to get back to doing my academic courses. And I remember that semester. Um, it was a spring semester. <coughs> Sorry. I had no money. I had no money means I had the little money that was I was earning through doing research as a stipend, which was enough to, you know, just take care of my monthly expenses, no savings or anything like that. And, uh, but the tuition fees was about, you know, I forget the exact amount, but it was something like, uh, it must have been like $5,600 that I had to pay for that one semester for my tuition. I, I said, God, you've taught me about faith. Your word is true. And I'm asking you that you will provide for me. Right. So I started attending. I registered for my classes. I started attending classes. You have a little time before which you have to pay your fees. And I was just believing God. But that time went by. That means I was not able to pay my fees by the due date. And, you know, my mind was like Robert uh, Sitkin was mentioning, you know, my mind every morning when I wake up, I would be in so much um, tension, you know, in the sense that, hey, you haven't paid your fees. What are you going to do? But I would just immediately go back to the word of God. And I'd be just quoting all of the scriptures. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. I speak to this mountain. I speak to my uh, tuition bill that needs to be paid. And I speak over it and I declare it is paid in full in the name of Jesus. I owe nothing in the name of Jesus. So I was just, all I had was faith in God. I had no, and I, you know, I decided I was not going to call my parents or ask any money from anybody. This is what I'm going to do. Now, it was very difficult, you know, because I'd crossed the deadline. And I, uh, I remember in one of my classes, the professor called my name. He said, Ashish, you, you know, your name is here. It says you haven't paid your fees. I said, yeah, yes, sir, I'm working on it, you know. It was true. I'm working on it by faith. That's the only thing I had. But here's what happened. Uh, before, you know, so time went by. I was faithfully attending my classes. Uh, and now if you don't pay the fees, you're not going to get any credit for your courses or anything, you know. And uh, it's not a good situation to be in. Anyway, uh, this is what happened. I was, you know, I was working for a professor. Uh, he knew my situation. Now, the, 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 we were doing research for uh, another department. And uh, one day, one particular day, he got a fax. You know, those days, fax was used quite often. He got a fax from the head of that department for whom we were doing research. And the fax said, you know, uh, Dr. Hendrik, that was his name, said, you know, we have about $6,000 in excess remaining with us for this um, academic year, and we have to use that money for something before the year runs out. Do you have any ideas on how we can use it? And my professor, he walked in to me in the lab where I was. He showed me the facts and he said, Ashish, I'm going to tell him that we are going to use this money to pay your fees. He didn't have to do it. He could have used that money to buy equipment for the lab. He could have used that money to you know, do whatever else he wanted to do for the, you know, for his research. But he said, we're going to use this money to pay your fees. And, you know, within a short while, I had a check. I'd covered the full amount. I went so proudly uh, to the uh, cashier's place and I paid my fees. And from then on, all my fees, everything was covered. But Here's that, you know, what I'm, the reason I'm sharing that is, you know, things, you know, were not easy. Uh, uh, you know, emotionally, mentally, it was very challenging. You know, when is this money going to come through? How is it going to come through? I had no idea. All I had was, I'm going to believe God. God is faithful to his word. And it happened. Right? So, Sid you know, there are times we have to press through. We have to be firm and God will come through. He will not fail, right? Now, uh, I, uh, I may have missed a few other questions. 
uh, you know, we have to pause here because we have to get ready for our next class. I'm just going to uh, make it, I'm just copying these questions. Okay, I have, there's one more question, Nicholson. Okay, so we will, uh, we will you know, answer more questions next class, okay? So we will pause here because I actually ran over time and we need to go to our next class. Uh,